because of COVID, we unfortunately can't have speakers on campus this year, but I'm very excited that we can do some virtual um, events for you. We'll have one coming up in the spring, so keep an eye out for details on that uh, later this year and the early part of next year. I'm really excited to, uh, to have our guest this evening. His name is Tim Shark. He's a, he's a freelance journalist, and he's somebody I've known about for several years now. And in fact, it's because of Tim that some of my own research got sparked, and we'll be talking about that um, later in the evening. But um, I think you're going to find Tim a very interesting and dynamic speaker. I'm not going to tell you too much about him because our talk this evening is going to sort of be Tim revealing uh, his life as a journalist. So um, with uh, not much further ado, I'm going to start the questioning and uh, tell you that, uh, Tim, thanks for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, I hope our journalism students uh, are going to get a lot out of this. Oh, and by the way, we do have um, the live chat should be working in YouTube. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and post them in the chat and we will get to at least some of them uh, later in the evening uh, before we sign off for the night. Uh, once upon a time, I had thoughts of being a journalist, um, and I actually started out my college career uh, as a journalism major and about a month into it switched to English for various reasons, but um, I'm really interested in your life because you didn't, you didn't become a journalist in sort of the conventional way. So uh, we'd like to hear, how did you actually get into journalism and what sort of sparked your interest and, and got you into this as your career? Well, good evening. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, well, actually, I, I think, strangely enough, my first uh, sort of experience in journalism was when I was like nine years old and I was living in South Korea and there was a revolution that happened before my eyes virtually where students led a demonstration against an aging autocrat who, who had been led a very oppressive government and uh, people were sick of the oppression and st people started massing in the streets. And uh, it was right in the area where my father had his offices. My father was a, uh, ran a church relief organization in the late fifties and early sixties in South Korea. And I, and I kind of like, you know, I was, it was exciting time for me because there was martial law and can't, you know, tanks in the streets and stuff like this. But and a lot of people were actually you know, killed and, and, and shot down by, by, mil by military and police. But eventually this revolution prevailed and the government of Sigmund Rhee was thrown out and they won their, they won their democracy. And it was, it, was, it was quite an event. And for me, it really opened my eyes. It was like, you know, the first time I'd ever you know, sort of seen how a revolution could actually work uh, as opposed to being in theory, something you read about in, you know, in school or something. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I was very, I read the newspapers every day. So like I cut out all these newspaper clippings from the time and I still have them. I saw that it's actually online and my website. Um, uh, but it was, you know, the newspapers are amazing in part because the army had actually gone in and, and censored stories and pictures, photographs, by just scratching them out. And, and so you had these newspapers filled with like censored stories and, and, and photographs. So it's just, you know, the whole thing was, you know, quite amazing to me. And that really kind of got, you know, that first uh, scrapbook I made was kind of like my first journalism. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, the, but, but seriously, the way I got into it was, you know, living in, living in Korea and I lived in Japan also. Uh, I was very, got to know about the war in Vietnam very early. Uh, and so I got very involved in the anti-war movement, both while I was in Japan and later when I went to college. And, uh, you know, for, for a long time, like maybe from my, by the time I was like 16 or 17, all the way to the end of the war in 1975, I was, you know, I was very involved in, in, in different levels of engagement. Uh, and, uh, you know, during the war and after the war, a lot of people started uh, that were like, you know, okay, how did we, how did this war start? And how did Vietnam War start? And who's responsible for it? And uh, people started focusing on the war companies, the corporations that were behind it. You know, for example, uh, the US used a lot of napalm 
terrible weapon during Vietnam and also during the Korean War. There was this company, Dow Chemical, that made the napalm. You know, so people would would find out, you know, who this company was and who's on the board of directors and start putting pressure on this company. Uh, and there was demonstrations against against Dow Chemical and things like that. And so I got I got really interested in looking at the power structure, you know, first with the war and then, you know, places where I was living and the, the, the companies that were sort of dominant, the corporations that were dominant in the local economy, exporting, you know, like when I lived in the Pacific Northwest, there was a lot of companies that were exporting raw logs to Japan and they were shutting down mills. And so the, the mills that would finish the wood, they, they, they were, those people lost their jobs and all the jobs went to Korea and Taiwan where they were building these other you know mills with cheap labor and so I really got in, interested in following corporations and that was actually you know some of the first reporting I did uh, was about multinational companies and their their impact uh, both in the U.S. and 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 and, and uh, overseas and so in in you know I actually went to graduate school uh, I could have gone I could have double majored in in uh, journalism and Asian studies, but I focused on Asian studies. And I came when I and I did. I studied about modern Japan and Korea that, that I had grown up in during the Cold War. I wanted to sort of understand the history that I had sort of lived through as a kid. And um, you know, was there, during that time, I decided I really wanted to you know to write. And 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 for me, it was a, it was an activism kind of thing. You know, it was a way to get people concern about American foreign policy was to was to do exposures of, of in this, you know, in my case, you know, the companies that were involved in the corporations and what they were doing. And so, you know, out of that, uh, you know, I started getting involved in, in, in writing for different magazines that published that kind of stuff. And um, eventually I, I uh, got a job uh, in the business press uh, where I really learned how to how to report on on business, which was you know great skill to learn, uh, and I basically you know I've been doing that ever since. But that, it was sort of you know so I didn't go to J school and figure it out that way. I I it was my sort of my own experience and wanting to inform people about things that I had learned about that I thought were important to know, so we could you know early on you know stop the war and prevent another war like that from happening. Since you were a little unconventional in how you, you went about this, how did you get your first assignment and what was it? Well, actually, my very first article was, I think it was for, it was for the student newspaper in the University of Oregon where I was getting my, <laughs> where I was getting my master's degree. It was, you know, it was a good place. It was an, like opinion uh -huh. piece, right? Uh, but that, that was good practice. Uh, and, and you'll get it. And I think I wrote some articles at the time for the city, the newspaper that was published by the, in Eugene, Oregon, the, the, at the time, the Register Gardens, I wrote some op-eds there. And that was kind of cool to get that kind of byline in the paper. And there was, for a long time, uh, there was a left-wing newspaper published in New York called the, called the National Guardian. It had been around for a long time. And uh, this was like pretty hard left kind of newspaper. And, but they were the only ones who were really interested in, in, in writing and publishing stuff about Korea. So I think my first, you know, bylines were there. And I actually wrote about Korea for them for, for quite almost, I don't know, 10 years maybe. Uh, but so that, those, are, those are my first um, articles. And then like, in terms of like, uh, you know, major newspapers uh, during the 1980s. Uh, after working, I came. I moved to Washington in uh, from the West Coast in 1982, and I actually came here to work for Ralph Nader, the consumer guy, oh, uh -huh. uh, and uh, edited a magazine that he was publishing about multinational companies. And uh, he and I we didn't get along very well. We had different visions of, of how to cover business and how to cover labor and issues like that, how to cover American foreign policy. Uh, but, you know, it was, it was good experience. And I, and I published a lot. I mean, I actually ran a magazine and, and you know, put together articles and, 
and uh, you know was was trying to get writers to 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 to, to put out articles for me and and that kind of thing. And I when I left uh, that magazine, um, I was sort of like on my freelancing for a while without a without a full time job working, doing, doing research for human rights groups, and in some cases, labor unions, uh, which was basically journalism, you know, investigating working conditions in South Korea, because at the time, uh, unions like the United Auto Workers and the United Steelworkers were very concerned about low cost automobiles and steel coming into the United States that was produced by workers whose wages were kept artificially low because they lacked union rights. They lacked the rights to organize. And, and so there was, there was a lot of, um, you know, at the time, you know, in the, in the late seventies, in the 1980s, a lot of, you know, industrial plants all over the US were closing. Uh, and so people were making connections between the plants closing and plants starting up in, in, uh, in Asia, kind of a continuation of what's, you know, going on today. Uh, one of the reasons I think Trump has attracted people because he's kind of latched onto this issue. And in fact, you know, huge numbers of manufacturing jobs have been lost in the United States, not just to China, as Trump claims, but to, to many countries. And it's not just those countries stealing our jobs. It's corporations that decide they can make more money over there uh, rather than here. Uh, and, and I think, you know, so, so part of my focus there has always been, you know, look, it's not the bad Chinese, it's not the bad Koreans, it's the more, it's the corporations that are running the system. They're the ones taking the jobs away and they shift them around. You know, if it's, if unions organize in Korea, they go to Vietnam, if they, you know, and so on, you know, they, they follow the labor basically. Um, but anyway, I, eventually I got a job in a business newspaper that covered the maritime industry. And it was actually, it was a major newspaper called the Journal of Commerce. Unfortunately, it's uh, been downsized like crazy, but uh, I was with that paper for a long time. And I, and I covered, uh, you know, well, when you cover the maritime industry shipping, uh, anyone in Texas will know this, it's, you know, you cover ports, uh, you, cover, you cover oil tankers, you cover the, the ships, the container ships that move goods. Uh, you know, you cover all, all kinds of things. You cover the banks to lend the money to the companies to buy the ships. You cover the government agencies that, that monitor shipping and that monitor uh, global transportation. Uh, so, you know, you, you get into all kinds of angles. So I covered, you know, you know, I covered Congress, I covered the White House, all from this aspect of sort of covering uh, global trade. And, and, and uh, in, my, in my case, my at that newspaper my my first job was to cover was to cover labor i was hired as a labor reporter and and uh because especially in the shipping industry uh which is heavily unionized if you have good contacts within the unions you can find out a lot about what's going on with shipping uh and and so so that was sort of an avenue into 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 all kinds of reporting uh, you know, and, you know, and eventually, uh, you know, you'll learn all kinds of aspects of how Washington works and, you know, how, you know, companies come together to form lobby groups and who they hire to represent them. These, you know, well-known people that once served in government become their spokespeople and that kind of thing. You see this kind of underside of Washington, the pressures that are placed on lawmakers to, to make certain kinds of policies. And so, you know, I, I got to be really interested in the way that business helps shape policy, sometimes in an open way and sometimes in a mo more covert way. And uh, wrote a lot about, uh, wrote a lot about that and how that in influences foreign policy. Um, so, you know, it was sort of a slow process, but th that was a great experience working in the business press. It was like being a cub reporter, you know, learning the oh. basics of reporting. <laughs> so um, back in those olden days, you didn't have uh, the internet, uh, no, which I'm sure is that. very helpful. I'm sure it's very helpful to journalists now to have the internet for all kinds of reasons. 
So as you were, um, especially starting out your career and you were in the US, but you were doing work on the labor movements and things that were happening overseas, I don't know that, I mean, did, did they send you overseas to report or were you having to rely on what people were telling you or how did you, um, how did you track what was happening in Asia if you were in the United States? Well, in the, in the, in, you know, before I got that job at the Journal of Commerce, um, like I mentioned that I was freelancing for a few years and this was in the early eighties. Uh, and so actually when I worked for that Nader magazine, I went to Korea, I think once, I think I went to South Korea at least once during that time. And then afterwards, I, I uh, went uh, to report for different magazines. So like I got commissions from, uh, I got assignments from uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, for example, Oakland Tribune, papers in the Bay Area where I lived uh, to cover certain things. And so I'd write articles you know, for these newspapers on sort of a one-shot one -shot basis. Um, and then, you know, when I worked for the Journal of Commerce, uh, yeah, they, they would send me on assignment uh, from time to time. And I ran, our, I ran our Tokyo Bureau for a while, which was basically the Northeast Asia Bureau. And uh, so that, that, was, you know, that was out of Tokyo. And so I covered, you know, all kinds of sort of Asian is trade, trade issues around Asia uh, and, and uh, you, know, you know, trade and transportation issues. You know, shipping in Japan's a big power and global shipping and that kind of thing. So yeah, if you get you know you get a staff job, you know people send you. It's it's much harder when you're a freelancer because uh, back in the '80s, you know, freelancing it's incredible to me how much rates have dropped. I mean, the payments now you get people will offer you per article is just absurdly low. I mean, it's impossible to, 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 to live on it unless you have a rich father or mother or you know, it's, it's, I mean, you come from wealth or something. It's really hard to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. So you have to uh, make do and you have to figure out where you get your money. You know, there's grants available sometimes for reporters, but a lot of times you just gotta go there and try to find the story and just spend your own money and be there and, you know, in a place mm -hmm. like Korea. And uh, then, you know, when you get something, you, you know, may, may, you know try, to, try to contact an editor and persuade them that you got a story here. But I have to tell you, uh, focusing on Korea as I've done for so long, it was so hard to get anyone interested in Korea back then. And it's still pretty hard. <laughs> it's, just, it's just astonishing to me that a country can be a close military ally that Americans, you know, shed blood for during the Korean War. Americans, uh, the media seems to have very little interest in what's actually going on mm -hmm. inside South Korea. Anyway, they're they're totally, totally uh, focused on North Korea, but you know, South Korea is pretty interesting. But it, it is. Just, it is it very interesting. Very, very, <laughs> very, it's a fascinating place. Um, I was going to ask you about this a little bit later, but since um, you kind of brought up um, what your focus has been, I wanted to ask you about your book, Spies for Hire, because that's not about Korea. Um, and it's, I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing, but I've, I've, I've dipped into it and um, it's, oh, you got to cut. <laughs> oh, we can't see it because of the, oh, there you go. That's weird. There um, you go. There you go. So I'm really interested in how you sort of fell into this and um, what prompted you to investigate this and write the story or write the book. Well, okay, Spies for Hire is about the privatization of US intelligence. And it's, it's a phenomenon that is out there. Not many people understand it, but you know, at the beginning of, after 9-11 and the, you know, the beginning of the Iraq war, there suddenly began to be a, a lot of news about contractors uh -huh. being employed by the U.S. military and, and, and the CIA in, in the wars in both in Iraq and Afghanistan. And people may remember there was a whole scandal around in the early days of the Iraq war about this prison 
called Abu Ghraib, where it had been a prison that Saddam Hussein had, you know, had, had, had jailed his political opponents. Uh, and the U.S. took it over. And when the insurgency began against U.S. forces in Iraq, they just began to sweep through and just throw all kinds of people in this prison. And so the U.S. Army hired uh, contractors uh, to do some of the interrogations, and a scandal broke out because there was there was regular army contract regular army interrogators, and then there was contractors and People may remember the, 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 these people, these Iraqis were treated very brutally, uh, just horrible. There's, you know, pictures emerged of, of just, you know, really terrible treatment of these people, uh, sexual torture and, uh, you know, uh, just uh, abuse, all kinds of abuse that it was, was to many senior military officers was very wrong and not, nothing they had ever experienced even you know when they fought in wars in Korea and Vietnam, it was it was really, it was really something. And so it, it was exposed. There's big stories about it. And I was astonished to find out there were contractors involved. I mean, I, I you know I, I my father had learned Japanese in World War II, uh, and when he was in the Navy because the Navy wanted people to speak Japanese so they can interrogate prisoners. You know. But I couldn't, you know, it's like, that's what Navy officers did. They interrogated Japanese prisoners of war. And so it seems like a military function to me. And to, to, to hear that contractors were doing it for profit just astonished me. And I'm like, so, okay, who is this company that was involved in Abu Ghraib? And it was this company called Khaki, C-A-C-I. So, you know, luckily we had, we had the internet. I started looking up, who is this company? And I found, you know, it's here's this, mil, this intelligence company that has contracts with military intelligence and, and U.S. intelligence agencies like the CIA. And they have all on their board of directors and a lot of their executives are like former, are like former uh, government officials and intelligence officers and army officers. And so, and so like they're helping, you know, they're basically in, in the same business they were before, except now they're doing it for profit. So I, I started, you know, I started like, okay, here's this one company, there's other companies. So I started discovering all these other companies. And uh, so, you know, I, I wanted to start writing about this. So I, I did, I actually, when I was back, I was still writing for the nation now. I, I've been writing for the nation magazine in New York since 1983. And, uh, and actually around that time, around the time George Bush came into office in 2001, the nation hired me to do some investigations of the Bush foreign policy. And, and so I started looking at, um, you know, as soon as the war started, I was, you know, started looking at these, not only these, these intelligence contractors, but other, you know, companies that were working for the military. And, and so the, my question began, you know, I tried to figure out like, how, you know, how many contractors are actually working for American intelligence? And I couldn't get a number. And I know I would talk to these intelligence people and, you know, talk to their press office or, you know, talk to people I knew I were out in the field and that kind of thing. And no one could really tell me, you know, I don't know. And I said, was it, is, there, is it like 50% of the budget? What is it? You know, 25%. And, um, so I started writing about it and uh, it, it, the, the only, so that's how I started writing a book. Uh, you know, started writing like how, how did intelligence get privatized and how did it begin? And, you know, what I found was it sort of began in a big way after the Cold War when, you know, a lot of budgets were cut in the CIA and the Defense Department and people were employees were caught and they went to work for private companies. And then when there'd be a need for a certain kind of intelligence, the US government agencies would hire these former, former military or former intelligence who are now working for these different companies back to do work on a temporary basis for the US government. And that's sort of how it got, that's sort of how it got started before 9-11. And then after 9-11, when you know, intelligence budgets almost quintupled after that. 
And so there was this like, you know, billions of dollars were pouring in to the intelligence budget. And these companies, uh, these, these agencies, you know, just started hiring contracts like, like contractors like crazy. And uh, so, so even, even while I was writing it, this, this industry was expanding. And uh, so that's how I got into that, that book, which was published in 2008. And there was a paperback version published in, in 2009. Uh, it's still a pretty interesting subject, but not, there's really no other book except mine about the whole phenomenon and how, how, it, how it began. How was the book received when it was published? Well, a lot of people, well, it, you know, it got pretty good reviews. It, I, I think the way that books do well is if the, if the publisher can do a really good marketing campaign, you know, and, and sort of being able to communicate what the book's about and get people interested. Uh, but the, my publisher, Simon and Schuster, they, they, they didn't really do a very good job of promoting the book. Uh, but you know, it was read. It was it's still well read among that community. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm amazed. And and then it wasn't. I I I. It's a, it's a very factually based book. It's uh, sort of I, I sort of my analysis, my political analysis and opinions kind of come in more toward the end, uh, because at the time, you know, while I was writing it, we learned that. The National Security Agency, which does electronic surveillance of phone calls all over the world, and it's been doing that since the early 50s. You know, after 9-11, President Bush and uh, the General Hayden, who ran the National Security Agency, secretly agreed, you know, to, to turn all the NSA's eyes and ears onto the United States and began collecting intelligence on American citizens, which was a real shock when that news came out in 2005. And I had already done a lot of research and reporting on some of these companies. And so to my astonishment, you know, some of these companies that I was following were, were working on these programs and doing, collecting the intelligence on American citizens. And in fact, that was why, you know, when all this came out, uh, and, and, you know, people in Congress began to be concerned about uh, the spying on Americans, uh, that, uh, you know, a law was passed revamping the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and then that the new law gave immunity to companies that had been involved in this illegal program. So, you know, companies, you know, got a real break. Um, from, from the Congress, uh, you know, they could have been prosecuted uh, if any prosecutions had happened from that. Um, so, it, you know, that, that, that was a really interesting area to, to write about. And I'm still very, you know, I still write about intelligence now and then. I have an article coming out. I think it's gonna be, it should be out this week about the South Korean Intelligence Agency, the National Intelligence Service and how it operates and, and how it deals with North Korea and also the United States. Um, so I'm still really, I still follow that and I still get lots of calls from, from reporters. Uh, you know, like I, I wrote about all these companies and you know, any, like any industry, the companies, you know, someone else buys them and then that company sold to somebody else and these companies morph into other companies. But a lot of times the same people stay with them, right? So, so like, you know, some reporter will run across some company and they'll call me up and say, hey, I, you know, I, I looked up your book and you, you write about this company. Can you tell me more about it? You know, and sometimes I'll like, I never heard of that company. They'll say, well, it's on page 84 of your book. You know? um, in, in listening to you talk, um, it's obvious that your interest in politics and world affairs, you know, started when you were, you said nine years old when you were a kid but you also have a very inquisitive mind and I know that you love doing the investigative work um, and I, I I'm hoping that we do have some of our journalism students who are watching this today and so I'm wondering you know if I were 20 or 21 years old getting ready to graduate and I, I want to do the kind of work that you do um, how would somebody today 
become an investigative journalist, um, maybe, you know, not necessarily working for a company unless that's the only way to do it, but actually getting out and sort of getting into the meat and potatoes of things like you did. How do, how would you do that now? Uh, well, you know, for, for, one, for, first of all, the whole model of journalism has completely changed. You know, it used to be, you know, there's like newspapers in every city, major newspapers, and there'd be like smaller newspapers in smaller cities. Um, but now, you know, the newspaper industry has been very consolidated. And then, you know, it almost collapsed really, you know, kind of during the 2000s, early 2000s. Uh, and it's been replaced by, now there's like sort of nonprofit uh, news agencies that get money from foundations and places like that. So the model has changed, but in terms of getting into it, you know, there's still lots of good local newspapers. And there's, you know, like a lot of times, you know, you, you can be really young and really want to, you know, be like Bob Woodward or something and get into the, <laughs> you know, the, the in most intense issues affecting Americans right away. But, you know, it's, it's to me, it's better uh, to, to start from the bottom you know, and, and, you know, get a job at a local newspaper. Uh, and there's so many good newspapers, you know, Texas, Austin paper states, the, the, I forget the name of it, but it's a really, it's a really good paper, right? Um, you know, Dallas morning news, papers like that. You know, you get, you get on one of their desks, you know, you get on their business desk, or you get on their Metro desk and you, you know, you just, you know, you get, you get to, you do the work that you're, you're assigned to. And, but you learn the basics of reporting, you know, you learn like, you know, well, it, it, it's not really, uh, it's not being objective so much as being fair. You know, you can't obviously, you know, you learn about, you know, a c corrupt uh, local official. Uh, so if you're gonna do a story, obviously uh, you, you build the evidence and you talk to people and you get some documents maybe and of course you have to go to the person who you're writing about and say, you know, I have this, I'm, I'm, you know, we're gonna publish a story. Do you have any comment, you know, et cetera. You have to do, you learn all that kind of stuff and how to report fairly and to make sure you're accurate. Accuracy is just, you know, so critical and make sure your facts are right. But that's where like, you know, being a, a, a cub reporter is, is, really, is really great because there are so many good editors out there and unfortunately, in the re in the reorganization of many news organizations, sort of the middle layer of editors was was there, you know people over fifty. They would just uh, we got to get rid of these people, and so that's what's happened. A lot of newspapers. So you have like they're, they're top heavy. You have like top editors, and you don't have many editors in between. But it's really important to have editors as mentors to help you along and, and you know to tell you that story's that story's crap you know you got to go back and you know get these details that's just not that's just not going to do it mm -hmm. and you know that 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 makes you be a better reporter and then you know once you build it once you build a uh you know you, you get a lot of stories under your belt and you have some good clips then you can you know move up and you know send send an application you know, to, a, to another newspaper where you might be, you know, covering something more interesting or, mm -hmm. or, or something in your field where it's, you know, you, you might get, you know, better coverage and, you know, move, move up the chain. There's also like organizations, like I mentioned, these nonprofits like ProPublica is one. Mm -hmm. uh, ProPublica has actually won some Pulitzer's since it was created about four or five years ago. And what they do is that they, you know, they team up with local newspapers and, and, and broadcasting companies to do joint investigations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, organizations like that, you can also start as a, you know, as an intern. Um, and sometimes they have, you know, paid internships, but, you know, basically you got to learn the basics. You know, you can't, I mean, not everybody, uh, you know, like, you know, you know, Woodward and Bernstein, when they were at the Washington Post, I mean, you know, they were cub reporters. Uh, I mean, you know, Woodward actually, you know, he had a lot of contacts in intelligence because he, he himself was in Navy intelligence. And so, you know, he actually, were, you know, spent some time in the White House when he was, you know, an officer and he got some of his early contacts. That's how he met Deep Throat, you know, the guy who gave him so much information during their during their Watergate days. But, you know, you know, Bernstein was, you know, 
was on the Metro desk and he, you know, he was just, you know, covering local stuff. And, you know, he was assigned, you know, to cover this, you know, court hearing for these burglars who, you know, broke into the Watergate. And, you know, if, if they had just been low level burglars, that's all it would have been, you know, but uh-huh. then the, they, they, you know, the, the judge had them identify themselves and like, oh, this guy is a former CIA and this guy is a former FBI. Not only that, they're working for the committee to reelect the president, Nixon, you know. Mm-hmm. And so they, the connections started flowing, and but they but they had to nail it down. It was, yeah. you know, I mean that that movie, the movie they made about them, uh, is is a fantastic movie, and and how to do that kind of reporting. Okay. And you know, to, to be truthful, you know, I haven't spent that much time in furtive, you know, like furtively meeting with someone in a, in a parking lot in the dark <laughs> you know you don't see their face yeah uh, like they do in all the president's men but you know i've met plenty of sources who did not want to be identified and, and had, but had a lot of, you know had an important story to tell and, and also gave me leads you know wanted to expose something at a company and gave me documents to, so i could do a story and that, that kind of thing but it really takes you know, you have to have a lot of curiosity. I mean, it's, 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 there are not very many jobs when you can go to work and just, you know, just call people because you're trying to find something out, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it can be, it can be interesting day to day, you know, all day, it can be very different day to day. So that's what I would do. But, you know, uh, these days uh, it's really hard to get, it's really difficult to get hired at a publication if you're like older than 40 or something. It's <laughs> not, you know, not to say anything negative about young people because young people you know, you have That's lots right. of energy and stuff. But like, you know, I do, it's, it's an industry that I think is very ageist and, and doesn't really want older people working there anymore, which is really too bad. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, a lot of us, I mean, like my newspaper, the Journal of Commerce, was sold out from under me. It was sold to another company, and then uh, it was they promised to make us bigger and better. And then all of a sudden, one day, they said, "You know, we're we're shutting you down," or they were they downsized us. And we went. My bureau in Washington was about we had about ten reporters, I think. In one year, it went down to one reporter, and and that happened to lots of papers during the late 90s, 2000s. Um, and so I really haven't been in a newsroom since the late 90s. And except for, you know, visiting friends or something, but like I haven't worked in a newsroom for a long time and I miss it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great atmosphere to work because, you know, most people that work in newsrooms have the same kind of curiosity you do. And so as a reporter, so it's, it's, it's fun to be around reporters. And I spend a lot of my time, you know, when, you know, I mean, I, I, it's, it's like, well, these days, you know, COVID, you can't really, you know, go around and see people, but, you know, I have people that are friends that are journalists and, you know, we'll, we'll talk, you know, we'll talk through our stories. We'll talk, you know, what's coming up, you know, what's going to be good to cover, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so, so the collegial aspect of it is, is really, is really good. I, I really appreciate that. This is all this is all a good segue into the last thing we're going to talk about. We only have about 10 minutes or so left before we get to questions. So okay. um, the last thing I want to ask you is um, the big project that brought me to you and, and made me aware of you in the first place. And without I don't want to get into the politics of it. Um, I want to talk more about the actual investigation part of it. Uh, one thing that our journalism professors here do is they they really emphasize for our students, the importance of the Freedom of Information Act. And yeah. um, as you were saying earlier, tracking down the facts to be as fair and um, you know to make sure that what they're reporting is, is accurate. And right. you have, you have a, a huge project that you have been working on for a long time where that was your goal, was, was you actually sought out um, through Freedom of Information Act and then through items that were declassified, but you sought out documents that would tell a story um, and you proved some things that people hadn't known before. So without really getting in too much into the politics, explain what the project is and, and how you were able to do what you did. 
with uncovering well, all the information and everything uh, and the documents. Well, the story was about the Guangzhou uprising, which of course you know all about, uh, but it was a, a uprising in a city in southern, southwestern South Korea against a martial law army that came in and started massacring people. And citizens started fighting back and uh, they eventually pushed the military out. And uh, the city was surrounded by the Korean military. And the US saw South Korea and the military as you know, strategic ally and was very concerned that this rebellion would spread. And so the, the US, um, this, the Carter administration decided to, even though they knew that the military was responsible for all this bloodshed, that they had killed all these people, they decided that the up uprising uh, caused a, threatened South Korean security. And so they agreed to support the South Korean army, put down this uprising, which they did. And uh, when that happened, a lot of information, that information wasn't known. It was like, you know, it was, it was, it was known that the U.S. had released some troops under joint U.S.-Korea command to be used to put down the rebellion, but that's all it seemed to be. And of course, the U.S. officials played all that down and said, you know, this, this what happened was very terrible in Guangzhou and so on. Um, and and so this mass, the uprising and the massacre that happened was, you know, once the full the, the whole story was suppressed in Korea for years because the media was under military rule was suppressed. You could not read it. Books about it were banned. You could be arrested for having information about it. So uh, when the, finally when the, there was democratization in South Korea, the, the, the National Assembly there began to investigate what happened and the US put together what they called, a, the US government put together a white paper about what, from the US point of view, what its decision-making had been at that time. And when that white paper came out, I knew how to use the Freedom of Information Act and I had used it before. Uh, but I put in a massive request because what I did, I went to this white paper and every time they mentioned a meeting, every time they mentioned, a, you know, someone wrote a memo to so-and-so, I, I asked for that document. I asked for the minutes of the meeting, you know, because when you do freedom of information requests, you have to be very specific in what you're asking for. Otherwise, it becomes kind of a wild goose chase for the agency. But you can say, you know, there was a meeting on April 13th, 1986, and, you know, so-and-so was there from the State Department. Uh, then they can go. They can go look on the records, and they can decide whether or not to give it to you or not. Whether it's you know uh, whether it's going to violate national security secrets or something. And but anyway, I put together a pretty large request, and it took me about six, seven years to get most of the documents. Uh, so from '91 to about '96, I guess five years, I finally had enough documents to to do a story. Uh, and it happened to be, I, 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 during that time I was collecting these documents, the South Korean government had arrested and put on, was about to put on trial the two generals who later became presidents, the two generals who had, you know, led the, who had led the martial law, law army and then who had crushed this rebellion. They were jailed and they, and they were, they were put on trial. And so my stories I was able to break my story like the day before the trial or something like that. And so that was a great, you know, news peg for this story. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, actually I gave a talk to some students in Gwangju last night in Korea about this very topic. And, you know, one of the things I stressed is that documents can be very interesting and enlightening uh, and shed light on, on things you, you never knew, but, to really tell the story, you have to do the reporting and the documents and you have to talk to the people who wrote them, who received them, how they were interpreted, what was really meant uh, and so on. You know, so, so it, it takes a lot of follow-up work. So I ended up, you know, one of the main authors of the, many of the State Department documents I got was the US ambassador at the time, whose name is William Gleistein. And, and uh, so when I got my documents, I, 
you know, I met with him and I interviewed him extensively. And his his side of the story was was you know all over the all over the story. Although he he didn't like my story, uh, but you know I, I I never he never I never misquoted anything he said. He just he thought it he thought I made it look like he had approved you know using violence. Uh, but you know the the facts I put out were were never 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 challenged. But it's a really it's it's it's. Uh, you know, these documents I got, for example, they showed two things. They showed that the U.S., before martial law was declared even, the U.S. had met with the generals there and said the U.S. would, would, would not oppose if you used army troops instead of police to control demonstrations. Uh, and and uh they said as long as you don't let this get out of control, which did, which actually did get out of control. But the fact is, the, 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 my report that the U.S. had met with them and basically given them a green light to use the military uh, really angered Koreans. And uh, in fact, the day after my stories came out, there was demonstrations in front of the U.S. embassy in Seoul, uh, <laughs> which, which I had never experienced in a story before. Um, but you know, it, it's it's but you know it was it it it, it was the truth, and the the U.S. you know had a hard time you know explaining explaining you know what was in these documents, and that's why having the primary sources is so important. Yeah, absolutely, and and you know a lot of them, well, a lot of the documents were uh, you know heavily redacted, which means censored. Basically, they they cut out big sections that they think will uh, tell people about national security secrets or, you know, expose methods uh, that, that the CIA uses or something. But so like this, the, the, the documents I got from the CIA, they're almost all blacked out and still are. They're still classified. Um, I've gotten some of the State Department ones that, that were heavily redacted. I've gotten them fully declassified. And a lot of times when you do, when you when you have, when you get to documents on foreign relations and, you know, relations with another country, uh, a lot of times what's redacted, what's kept out is what the foreign government is telling the U.S., what the foreign officials are saying, because foreign officials don't like their, you know, private conversations with U.S. diplomats be exposed, sure. you know, yeah. so, so the, the U.S. kind of follow, a lot of times that's cut out, but but in, in some of the ones I've gotten fully declassified, say when they met with this general in South Korea, Chun Doo Hwan, now his comments can be read and you can see mm -hmm. you know, what he said. Um, so, so that's sometimes they're incomplete. You know, so you, you have to talk to, you, know, you can try to talk to the foreign government officials to see mm -hmm. what they in mm -hmm. fact did say. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a really, uh, it, you know, so many people have gotten FOIA stuff, freedom of information material, and so many things. That's really people have really broken some great, great stories and really op opened people's eyes to all kinds of wrongdoings by by government and you know exposing corporate malfeasance and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We um we're getting to the end of our hour and we haven't had any questions yet. But um this is a this is the time. If you have a question for Mr. Shark, please uh type it into the into the chat in YouTube and we'll wait a minute or two and see if we have any questions. Um, but in the meantime, while we're waiting to see if there are one or two questions, um, can you tell us what is the the funniest thing that's ever happened to you while you've been on the job, or a funny oh. story? Oh man, I don't know. It, it, it's it's uh, a lot. Like I, I can think of a lot of funny things. I can remember, um, you know, um, difficult, you know, absurd situations. You know, like I remember uh, I when I was working for the Journal of Commerce, I exposed this massive corruption scandal inside of a union. A maritime union where the top the leaders of the union had basically uh, in, in some kind of like weird legal uh reorganization paid themselves they, they quit their jobs and took new jobs in the same union that was reorganized and they paid themselves huge pension payments 
retirement payments and they kept working. Uh, and, and, and I, this was, this was actually a violation of law and, and rank and file members of the union, you know, started talking to the FBI and it, there was a trial and a lot of the union leaders were convicted. But I remember in one of my stories, the lawyer who had set this up, this, it, was, it was a big lawyer in DC and he represented this union and he had written the language uh, to, to make this uh, basically stealing of the union pension fund you know, possible and he put it in legal ease, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had information, in fact, I had a document from the federal court that said he was an unindicted co-conspirator <laughs> in, in, this, in this conspiracy and and this guy this lawyer you know I, you know I, I had to call him up for a comment right and uh, he he you know he is begging me not to name him as a co-conspirator he said like this will ruin my career and all this stuff I'm like I'm like you know dude I got the you know I have it here in black and white you know I'm, I'm this is in the story I'm sorry and he, he called my editor and he actually, he, he ended up calling the publisher and threatening the publisher of the newspaper, uh, you know, with some kind of lawsuit or something. And, you know, we, we reported it. Uh, my editor protected me. And, and, you know, sometimes you have to put up with a lot of crap like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the other thing is it's, it's, it's hard, you know, like, you know, like I'm going to write this and this is going to be reported and this guy, you know, his reputation is going to be very damaged by my story. And it kind of puts a lot of weight on your shoulders, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a, a sort of moral responsibility. You better get this story correct, uh, you know. And, you know, it was a maritime newspaper, so everyone in the industry read it, right? And so everybody in the industry knew this guy, uh, you know. So it's, it's things like that. But, but uh, so it's kind of like, I guess I don't really remember this funny things you know i remember uh you know i remember funny things like i had an editor who was kind of uh you know uh, my bureau chief was was getting kind of in, getting on an age and, and uh, he would he would like fall asleep at his desk in the afternoon <laughs> snoring loudly you know and like people would come visit our newsroom and like here's here's the bureau chief on his desk you know and he's, he's, he's like out of it uh, and there was also we, you know, we covered global trade, right? And there was this, there was this reporter in my bureau. This was in the nineties. I was there. And there was a reporter in my bureau who had been there for since like about 1959 or something. He was there all through the sixties and his desk was piled high, you know, eight, six, you know, piles of paper and documents like five wow. feet high on different parts of his desk. And this guy, Every day, he would write 500 word story. Every day, 500 words, and every day at lunch, every day at lunch, he would go out. He'd get some information in the morning, you know, get prepared. Our deadlines were like one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. We had early deadlines, and then he'd go out to lunch, and he'd have like two or three martinis, and he would come back. And he did this every day. And he'd come back, load it on martinis, write his 500 word story, and then he, then he, then he left every, <laughs> every, every single day. But that guy, you know, like you'd, you'd go over to his desk and he'd, you know, like, I, hey, Richard, uh, you know, I'm working on the story about these steel negotiations, you know, like, do you know, do you, you, know, can, you know, do you have someone I could talk to or something, you know, like, do you know, some lawyer or whatever? You'd say, oh, hold it this pile over here down down he'd pull out something and it'd be like you know some report from 1971 about the steel industry and you know <laughs> stuff like that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of characters in journalism i bet I there are that, that probably uh, th th that's where some of my um you know best best laughs were were just these insane people <laughs> not insane but you know just real characters sure, were really, sure really fun and sort of fun to work with but uh you know especially in the in the old days in dc people you know all you know i drank all the time and i would i remember one time there was a lawyer in dc it was a it was a norwegian lobbyist for norway had a big shipping industry you know so he would 
every Christmas he would invite all the maritime reporters to this lunch. And he would just load you with martinis. Uh, I still like martinis, but you know, I cannot have more than two martinis. And I don't know. I, I never know to this day how my colleague Richard would write a story on three martinis. Well, well we actually, you know. we have a question um, about what advice you have for our journalism students uh, post-graduation. So they, uh, they graduate and they're ready to go out into the field. Um, if they're over the age of 21, I don't know if you're advising that they have a martini now and then, no, but no. other than, other than, <laughs> other than the martinis, after, um, after, work. <laughs> after work, what's your advice for students who are newly graduated who want to, you know, who, who want to commit to this career? Well, I think other than what I said before about being like, you know, sort of get signed on it, be a, be a cub reporter somewhere, learn the, learn the business from the bottom. Uh, it's really important to get to know a subject or two, right? You know, that's sort of the most basic advice writers give to other writers is write what you know. And, you know, it makes a, it makes a big difference. You know, if you come from a town where there's, you know, uh, I don't know, I can't think of an example, but if you come from some place that has a certain industry in it and that industry, you know, you know, becomes a big player nationally or something and becomes, you know, like this, you, you know, get to know an industry because if you know an industry, how it works, your father or your mother's business or, you know, people that you know or something that you followed for a long time, you know, get to know something, a country, Get to go live in a, another country that you're interested in that has a lot of, you know, um, close relations with the U.S. or a lot of trade or, you know, exchanges with the United States where there's, you know, that news comes out of there. Get to know another country, but, you know, get to know certain subjects. Like, you know, I, re I really learned how to research corporations and research companies. So when I was starting out, you know, reporting on different shipping companies. I mean, I learned how to like, okay, you got to research, you know, the banks that lend the money and that kind of thing. So how do you research banks? You learn all these little skills like that. And then later on, when I was doing investigative reporting, when I had to find out about the finances, financial situation of a certain kind of company or an industry, I knew where to look. I knew where the, you know, where the industry publications were. So like, don't, and don't be, shy of going to work for there's lots of publications now that are very niche publications you know that, that that focus on you know the military defense industry or they focus on oil and gas or they you know they focus on the health uh health insurance market and things like that you know even that sometimes those kind of jobs uh seem boring or seem like you know like that may not be what you're interested in, but like I said, any kind, knowing any industry and how industry works with government and how the government oversees it, you can apply that to almost any other industry. So you get to know one area really well, become an expert on, on, on a country or an industry or a subject, certain kind of musicians, you know, certain, you know, whatever it is that yeah, you're interested yeah. in, you know, really get to know that area and get to know people in, in that area. And then, then you can have, you know, people you can call for expertise and, and, and contacts and that kind of thing. But, but, you know, your knowledge shines through your journalism, you know, the better you get to know something, then you can, you can write about it with some knowledge and, and knowing, you know, you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. So like that, you know, it's like, don't be afraid to take a job in a, in a, you know, in like I said, like a niche publication, you know, just because it's not the Washington Post. You know, if you're young, especially, you know, I mean, I didn't even get into journalism until I was like, you know, 30s in my, in my mid 30s, really. And I, you know, it took me a long time to really figure out what the lay of the land was. Because I had always written for these kind of alternative publications, right? Uh huh. Sure. But you know, sure. you, but but the thing is to really, you know. So, but I had some, you know. I've, obviously, I've been writing almost, you know, my whole life around about East Asia because I grew up there, you know, and I, you know, I knew a lot of people there, and I know people that go back and forth, and and you know, I spoke to, you know, I could speak Japanese, and and you know, so 
also, that's the other thing. Learn a language. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> here, you know, here in the United States, you know, learn Spanish. You know, I mean, it, it's like, you know, one of the, you know, a huge popular percentage of our population is, is Latina. So, you know, you, you, unless you can talk to people, you, you can't report. So, you know, and when you go into another country, learn the language. Uh, you know, that's critical. I mean, I wish my language was better. Uh, I have always regretted, you know, not really keeping up with my Japanese, uh, but that's essential. It's absolutely essential. But, you know, just, you know, keep, you know, be, be slow and steady in your career, if, you know, and, and it'll, it'll, you'll get there. You'll get there, but, you know, not, you know, stories like Watergate don't come <laughs> along every day. You know, it's, uh, but, you know, you can get some, you know, you can get some pretty interesting stories along the way that make a difference. One, one more just quick question, because we only have about a minute left. Um, what's a skill you can, th that you might not normally think of that would be good for, for our students to, to hone in preparation for this career? Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing that comes to my mind is get to be familiar with information that companies have to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, SEC, get to know, you know, get, uh, be able to understand financials because whether you're reporting on education or health, there's always gonna be companies you're gonna be writing about and you really need, it's essential to be able to understand the mechanisms of a company and how it operates. And so you have to get to be really get to be familiar with financials and how what they mean, you know, what a spreadsheet means, and to be able to find information. Like for example, um, nonprofits. There are many nonprofits that in the political world, you know, have a big impact, right? And a lot of people don't know that nonprofits, to keep their nonprofit status, have to file a form with it. Internal Revenue Service called a 990, where they have to say whether what their revenue is and what their top officers are paid, who the who the top officers are, that kind of thing. 990s can be incredible sources of information. So find out, get to be expert in financials. You know all the different array of of documentation to to put together a, a, a picture of a company or an industry. That's a very essential skill other you've, uh, than language that you need to have. You've just given us beautiful support for the value of a liberal arts education. So thank you for that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Tim Shark, thank you so much. This was a great interview. I enjoyed it. I had a good time. Thank you to Joey McReynolds, our tech guy, for, for keeping us going. Um, and again, thank you, audience, for, for being there. Thanks for your questions. And keep an eye out for our next event, which is coming up in the spring. Everybody stay well, stay healthy, wear your mask, and make sure you distance and we'll get over this COVID thing soon so we can have people back on campus. Tim Shark, thank right. you so much. Don't stop writing. Just keep <laughs> writing. Don't think about writing, write. Okay, <laughs> everybody write. Good night, right. thank you. Good night, bye-bye. Okay, we're done?